So it's been a while since we worked on the diesel Honda Insight, and the reason is we spent a lot of time playing around with the 670cc Predator-powered Renault. Well, the good news is, we pretty much have sorted out the Renault's drive system, and as luck would have it, now we're waiting on parts to build the new performance exhaust for the little French car. I think most of you folks are aware that in the previous episode, we made a huge compromise in order to get the Renault back on the road, and we had to temporarily install a performance robbing exhaust system because, well, the custom header that was previously on the engine would no longer fit, and that was due to the changes we made to the engine cradle, and while the car is now drivable, it's a bit slow. Well, let's be realistic. This car was never going to be fast with the 670cc lawnmower engine, but normally it's pretty quick, all things considered. Anyway, this week we're going to put the Renault on the back burner while we wait for the parts, and we're going to tackle one of the last major hurdles on the Kubota-powered diesel Honda Insight. So as you can see, we have the diesel engine bolted in place with some custom motor mounts. Now these mounts put the engine and transmission close to their final position, and there's some adjustability built into the mounting system. At some point, we'll finish welding the mounts, but before we do that, we have to make sure that we can get the new drive axles to fit the car. Now what makes this engine swap complicated is, well, of course, the diesel engine. However, we decided not to use the original Honda Insight transmission. Instead, we're using a transmission from a 1999 Saturn. This particular transmission is equipped with a set of close ratio gears that work really well with the little diesel engine. Now, keep in mind, there are a lot of things to consider when doing an engine swap, and since our choice of engine only develops 20 horsepower and 34 pounds-feet of torque, well, the transmission is an important part of the swap. Now, I'm sure there are other close-ratio transmissions available that would work just as well as the Saturn gearbox. However, we have already used this engine and transmission combo in another car, and we've spent a lot of time and money building this engine to transmission adapter. It only makes sense to continue using the Saturn gearbox, because after all, it's already connected to the Kubota engine, and it has the perfect gear ratios for this project. So, going with this oddball combination means we have to custom build drive axles to connect the Saturn transmission to the Honda Insight hubs. So, in other words, we have to splice the inner part of a Saturn axle to the outer part of a Honda axle. So, let's begin this journey by unpacking a brand new replacement axle that we got for the Honda Insight. The axle we're using is a low-cost replacement axle, and normally that's a big turnoff, but in our case, it's going to work out perfect. Well, almost. So on this axle, we're going to keep this end with the CV joint and cut off the other end with the tripod joint because that part ain't going to fit the Saturn transmission. And I reckon we'll eventually cut the axle somewhere around here. Now, it would be nice if we could actually remove the CV joint from this axle because splicing axles is a messy process and removing the joint is preferred. Well, because it'll keep the joint from being contaminated with grit and a bunch of other nasties. But you see, this is a non-serviceable CV joint, and non-serviceable joints are common on replacement axles. So on El Chibo axles like this, the CV joint is installed and then it can never be removed again. Well, unless you cut it off. So in case you're wondering, the correct way to remove the joint from the axle is to use this joint separator tool like this. These tools are awesome on snap together axles, but unfortunately it won't work on this axle, and I'll get back to this in a few moments. But first, let's take a look at an original axle that came with the Honda Insight. So as you can see, the original axle is quite a bit thinner than the replacement axle, and believe it or not, the anemic little gasoline engine that was originally fitted to the Honda Insight had a reputation of snapping axles. Well, the replacement axle is much thicker, and it's actually a lot stronger than the crap that came with this car. <laughs> actually, the aftermarket axle even has a stronger CV joint. So. Like it or not, this cheap off-brand axle is significantly better than the original Honda part. I know that's going to upset some people, but the truth hurts. Honda doesn't always build good stuff. Anyway, the tool I just showed you is what I used to take the original Honda axle apart. Now, when I tried using that same tool on our first attempt to build an axle, well, things didn't go so well. So here's the first axle that we tried to separate the CV joint from, and we spent hours trying various things, and finally we just ruined the CV joint. The joint just wouldn't come off, and that's when I learned that some replacement axles are built that way. It sucks, but that's the way it is. So it looks like we'll have to build our custom axles with the CV joint still attached, and that's going to be tricky, as you'll see in a minute or so. 
The first thing we need to do in order to build the custom axle is to determine how long the axle needs to be, and that's also going to be tricky. You see, in order to find out how long the axle should be, we had to remove the spring from the suspension strut, and without the spring we were free to move the suspension up and down. The reason we wanted to move the suspension up and down is, the length of the axle actually changes depending on how much the suspension moves, and it's the job of the inner tripod joint on the axle to vary the length of the axle. Now as an example, this is the original inner tripod joint on the Honda, and as you can see the joint is both flexible and it can move in and out. So in order to determine the correct length of the axle, we have to make sure that the tripod joint can slide in both directions without falling apart or binding. Anyway, once we cut the axle to the approximate length, we need to fit both parts of the axle to the car and run the suspension up and down to make sure the tripod joint can move freely in both directions. Basically, we want the tripod joint to be centered in its housing when the suspension is compressed to its actual ride height. Now normally it takes a few attempts at cutting the axles in order to get the right length, but in our case, since the CV joint doesn't come off the axle, we only have one shot to machine the Honda side of the axle, because once it's cut, that's it, we can't put the axle back on the lathe to do any more trimming. It'll make more sense in a moment. This Honda replacement axle is actually slightly thicker than the Saturn axle, and we need both the Honda and the Saturn axle to be the same diameter. So the area that we're going to splice the axles together needs to be trimmed down to 22 millimeter. I reckon the next step is to mount this Honda axle in the lathe so we can machine it to the right diameter and then machine the splice point. All right, let's do that. So I managed to get this axle on the lathe and it just barely fits, but it fits. The axle is supported on one end with a dead center and the CV joint is mounted in the chuck on the other end. So normally this flexible part is now rigidly mounted in the lathe. This isn't ideal, but since the CV joint won't come off, this is our only option. Eh, it'll be fine. So the first thing we need to do is reduce the diameter of the axle to 22 millimeter. Then we can machine the splice point. Fast forward a bit and we're on the second or third pass. I guess I'm going to be standing here for a while. I'll turn the camera back on when we've made some more progress. Okay, well, we got the axle down to 22 millimeter, and we also did most of the machining for the splice point. Now I can take the axle off the lathe and cut it right here. So this is the CV joint side of the axle, and of course that's the side of the axle that fits the Honda. And as you can see, I left a little nub at the end of the axle. Eh, that's kind of an experiment, so pay no attention to that. Now off camera I machined the Saturn side of the axle, so this part of the axle is where the tripod joint attaches. And thankfully the tripod joint was easily removed. Anyway, on this section of the axle I had more freedom and I was able to adjust the length so the completed axle would fit the car perfectly throughout the range of the suspension. And now we can put both axles together so they can be welded. You know, at first glance, this seems like a terrible idea, but before some of you folks freak out, it would be helpful if you actually did some research. You see, splicing axles is, well, never a good idea, but it's been done on much higher horsepower applications with good results plenty of times. For our project, we ain't worried how much power this axle can handle, and that's because the Kubota diesel engine doesn't develop a lot of power off idle, and it's not until the stupid charger or the turbo kicks in that the engine will make an extra few ponies or torques. But even at that point, the engine still isn't making any serious power, so we're good. Anyway, welding ain't going to be enough, so the axle will have to be reinforced with this sleeve. So with the addition of the sleeve, we can expect this axle to survive our experiment, and if it doesn't, we'll have learned something. Let's take a look at the assembled axle. You know, oddly enough, the left axle or the driver's side axle ended up being slightly longer than the original Honda axle. So this assembled axle has already been test fitted to the car, and it looks like it's the perfect length. So I reckon all we need to do now is weld it. Well, this welder ain't going to have enough power to fuse these axles together, and from what I understand, stick welding is preferred. So, we're going to have to send this welding job out to a professional, but before we can do that, we need to prep the axle so the person who welds it will have no problems. So in order to weld this axle together without any issues, I fabricated a welding fixture. This fixture will hold both axles in perfect alignment during the welding process. You know, details like this are sometimes overlooked when you send a job out, but it makes a huge difference in the results. 
Now to hold the axles in place while they're being welded, we'll use these disposable hose clamps and these will work perfectly. So once the primary welding is finished and the welds are ground smooth, the sleeve will need to be installed. Now the sleeve wasn't going to fit on the axle in one piece, so I sliced it in two, and now it can be welded in place with some weld penetration into the axle itself. This should work out pretty good. Well, let's grab all this stuff and head over to the welder. After a five minute ride, I ended up at Yoder Welding and Repair, located in Yoder, Kansas. These folks come highly recommended by the locals. Anyway, they were busy, but they said they could knock this job out by the next day. And today's the next day. I got the axle back, and for giggles, I mounted it to the lathe in order to check the runout. Let's see how it does. Not too shabby. You know, I reckon it would help if I could hold the camera still. The aluminum foil that you see was to keep the CV joint clean during the welding process. There are actually many, many, many layers of foil and tape under there. Alright, well, let's be a little bit more scientific and check the runout with a dial indicator. Not bad. Not bad at all. Looks like we have between five and six thousandths of runout, and some of that could be from the lathe. This is certainly good enough for our project. Fast forward a bit and we have the left side axle completely reassembled and that includes packing both joints with the correct grease, which by the way is a very messy job, but I managed. The boot for the tripod joint is the original Saturn boot from 1997, so it has a few years on it already. Now I did try a Dorman Universal Replacement boot that was recommended for the Saturn side of the axle, and I'm not afraid to say that boot is total garbage. It fits like crap, and I don't trust it at all. Yeah, it's pretty crappy, so don't waste your money on this Universal boot. Anyway, let's see how this axle fits the car. Alright, well, I've been looking forward to this day for a long time. This is more or less the last piece of the puzzle, and let's see if it fits. And there we go, the hybrid axle is now installed in this formerly hybrid vehicle. Well, <laughs> that's a twisted set of words. Let's see how the axle fits when the suspension is jacked up to its proper ride height. So the rubber brake line is kind of just hanging, and don't worry, I'll eventually attach it to its mounting point. But for now, it's just kind of going to be in the way. <laughs> I know, some people really like to panic when they see stuff like that. Yep, there really isn't much movement in the tripod joint, and it's funny because the Saturn tripod joint is a lot longer than the original Honda joint, so we actually have plenty of room for the axle to move in and out of the joint, so that's a bonus. Let's take a closer look at an area I was concerned about. This bracket here was potentially something that may cause some interference, and it looks like we have plenty of clearance. Let me simulate turning the steering wheel, and we can see if the clearance changes any. Yeah, this isn't anything to be concerned about. It seems fine. Now, like I mentioned, there's a lot of loose parts hanging, but that'll be taken care of when the car is reassembled. And I guess I need to clean these brake rotors as well. Pretty much every exposed piece of steel in the shop has picked up a layer of surface rust. And that's because we tried using a swamp cooler this past summer. Not a good idea. So at this point, we have the motor mounts fabricated, we have the transmission shift linkage sorted out, which I showed you in the previous video. And today we finished the axles, which was a major step forward. Now, in this video, we only mentioned the left side axle, but we did in fact make the right side axle as well. It's basically the same part. I still need to take a look at the hydraulic clutch release, but that's an easy project. I think more or less this car is ready to start going back together, so I can work on some of the smaller details like the exhaust and the cooling system. I really want to get this car on the road by early December, and that may actually be possible. Now off camera, we did spend a lot of time converting the fuel tank to work with diesel fuel, and we also went ahead and put in a fuel level sending unit in the tank, which I'm sure will come in handy. The larger fuel tank is something of a luxury on this project, and believe it or not, the main reason we decided to use the factory fuel tank is to eliminate the aroma or stink of diesel fuel from the cabin of the car. 
I mean, I love diesel engines, but I can't stand the smell of the fuel. We learned a lot from the diesel-powered Saturn experiment, and on this project, our goal is zero stink. I think as we move past autumn and into winter, this car will get more and more camera time. Now, one of the nice things about this car is, well, the diesel engine is liquid-cooled, and that means we can put a heater in the car, which I'm sure most of you would agree is nice to have when driving in the winter. Unfortunately, this car doesn't actually have a heater core, because, well, the whole HVAC system was removed years ago, and we'll have to figure something out, I guess. Anyway, I think that's about it for today. I have a lot of stuff to do on both cars, and I'll see you next time. Until then.